Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sports Speak. I'm Jared Smith, and alongside me is Alexis Yoder. Hi, everyone. Let's start off with some wins and losses from this past week. Men's basketball was at Illinois, and they lost 79-65, to and that was Tuesday. Thursday, men's hockey played against Wisconsin, and they lost 4-1. to Men's basketball was playing against Rutgers, and they won 75-67 to to give them their first conference win of the season. Okay, and men's hockey defeated Wisconsin 5-4 to on Friday. Also on Friday, both swimming teams were at Northwestern, and they swam against Northwestern in Iowa. The women, <laughs> nice. The women defeated Iowa, but lost to Northwestern, and the men lost to both Northwestern and Iowa. Uh, men's volleyball completed a, sw- a three to none set sweep of Ohio State on Friday. And then on Saturday, women's gymnastics lost to Nebraska by less than two tenths of a point. Um, Women's hockey defeated Mercyhurst two to one. Men's volleyball lost three sets to none to Ohio State. And then men's basketball got a winning streak going with an 81 to 78 victory over Northwestern. And Sunday, women's hockey defeated Mercyhurst yet again with a four to one win and they improved to eight one and one on the season and they're currently ranked ninth which is the first national ranking in program history right we'd like to welcome one of the men's basketball beat reporters for the daily collegian tanyan loose tanyan thanks for joining us today no problem good to see you as always happy to talk okay so First, I want to talk about, you know, what your initial expectations were for the men's basketball team heading into the season. You know, obviously they lost their big player, Lamar Stevens, due to graduation, he went into the NBA. So, you know, what were your initial expectations for the team this season? Honestly, I think my expectations were a little bit higher than most people's. I mean, they still had a lot of experience coming back at, across the board. I mean, they had John Harar playing at center, basically. He's been there for all four years now. And you had a lot of upperclassmen in Myron Jones, Jamar Wheeler, Isaiah Brockington, Miles Dredd. I mean, a lot of those guys have been through the gauntlet that is the Big Ten season, and they've gone through it for several years now. So they know what it takes to win in the conference. And so I had some pretty high expectations, but I mean, this year has just been really tough for any team in the league honestly I mean you could say argue that like 10 11 teams deserve to make the tournament so we'll see how it goes for them also I want to ask what your opinion has been of the coaching staff so far this season obviously Pat Chambers is no longer the coach and Jim Ferry stepped in the role as interim head coach so you know how do you think he's handled you know being thrust into that role and how do you think the coaching staff has done overall so far this season I think that they've they've handled it pretty well. And obviously, it's a very unique year, and especially because Penn State had like a big outbreak that they've had to deal with a lot of stuff that they haven't had to in the past, and obviously on short notice. But I think there really hasn't been a ton of change as far as like the philosophy of the team and how they play. I mean, they have a really I don't want to say like unique roster this year, and they have such limited depth at the forward position. So they really had to experiment with a lot of different defenses and stuff like that. I mean, they've tried out a zone recently and it's worked in some cases, sometimes not, but I think they've adapted well with what they have. Unfortunately, their team isn't super complete as some of the other teams are in the big 10 and they lack a little bit of depth, but I think that they've adapted well, especially some in-game decisions. I think they've made good adjustments at some points, but Every game that they're in has been a close game for the most part. And sometimes it just comes down to the wire and it hasn't gone their way. Okay, okay. Daniel, I got a question for you. What's been the strengths of the Penn State basketball team so far throughout the season? Really, I think it's been their experienced guard play. I mean, let's see, I think Isaiah Brockington and Myron Jones have both averaged nearly 20 points per game over the past two games when they got their only two wins of the Big Ten season, but even just off the bench, I mean, Miles Dredd is injured right now, but he's made some huge shots several times throughout this season and last season as well. And then Sam Sessoms, the transfer that they brought in, he's really had some excellent minutes for them. 
and he's not getting more that Miles Dredd is out. So he's just – he's a scorer. I mean, a lot of people have talked about in different broadcasts and opposing coaches and in interviews that he's a, your stereotypical Philly guard. He knows how to get to the basket, and he knows how to finish through contact. So it's really nice to have a player like that off the bench. Myron Jones and Isaiah Brockington are just pure scorers. They can shoot the ball from beyond the arc. They can pull up from mid-range, and they can get to the basket. So it's nice to have two guys like that who you can rely on. And then Jamar Wheeler isn't exactly like the offensive producer – but he's really, especially the defensive leader. I mean, he's, I think he's third right now in the Big Ten in steals, and he led last year. So he's their energy guy. He's a senior. He's the leader on both sides of the floor. And you can really tell when you're at the games that he brings a certain intensity that really helps drive this team. So their guard play has really kind of elevated them to the point where they are throughout the season. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about, you know, I've heard on multiple different broadcasts about how the improvement from last season to this season for Isaiah Brockington and Myron Jones, you know, it just seems like they're playing more in a rhythm, you know, they're getting their shots off quicker, getting them through and, um, you know, just being overall leaders on the offensive end, you know, have you seen that so far as well? Yeah, I mean, Myron had a pretty good season last year, but now I think he's just honestly elevated his offensive game. I mean, some of the shots that he makes are quite impressive. Um, so, I mean, when he pulls up from five, six feet from beyond the arc and he has made some really challenging contested mid-range jumpers. So, I mean, he's your really your go-to reliable scorer. And Isaiah, I mean, his main thing was that he didn't get as many minutes as he's gotten this season. Last year, he came off the bench for the most part. But when you, when you can go to the games, you could see that he was really explosive off the bench and brought different like energy to their offense. He was, I think, the team's premier like driver to the basket last year. He was really good at finishing through contact and getting to the rim. And I think he's just accentuated that this season. So both of them really have – they're reliable scorers, and you need that in a team, especially when their defense has been pretty poor this season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just want to bring up – you know, you alluded to it – in your last answer but you know I want to bring up one of the big weaknesses I've noticed is how they struggle to defend the paint night in and night out that's really been their kryptonite they cannot keep other teams forwards from controlling the paint against them you know why has this been so difficult you know other than the fact that they're clearly undersized compared to the rest of the Big Ten it's but you know you mentioned it before that they have John Hare who's pretty experienced yeah um I think obviously the size is a big portion. Unfortunately, their roster, they have a good roster, I think, in any other conference. But the Big Ten has so many talented guys on the inside that it's just kind of unfortunate that they don't have that presence there. And, I mean, John has played pretty well, I think, over the past couple games. And they've experimented a lot. But I think another issue is, like, the style of defense that they play. They really play, like, a high, like, on-ball pressure style defense. So they kind of – Sometimes John is kind of left on his own down there to fend for himself in the paint. And then they've tried to do stuff with like off ball help and all kinds of that. I mean, they've experimented with everything because it's been a major problem, as you said. But I mean, obviously, John, I think he's not much of a shot blocker in the presence. He really doesn't get that many blocks. Mm -hmm. And so obviously his size is the big problem. But I think it's generally just the talent in the Big Ten. I mean, when you have guys like Luca Garza, Travion Williams, Trace Jackson Davis, and then Kofi Coburn, like they're four players who have all been like had their name in the conversation for the player of the year award. So I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. It's just how can you start to mitigate that? And I think they've done pretty well over the past two games. I mean, another problem that they had was fouling and a lot of that stemmed from being unable to defend in the paint. They were kind of forced just to foul because they didn't have any other choice. Otherwise, just give away free points. So I think they've started to take some strides in the right direction. Tanya, and I guess on the offensive side, spacing, though, it looks like they're doing a really great job spacing the floor. Like you said earlier, they're able to get away open shots and, of course, sometimes contested. But can you talk a little bit about how spacing offensively is going for the team? Yeah, I think they've actually improved on that a little bit throughout the season. I think – to start the season they had a good amount of kind of isolation play where they would just give it to one of Myron Jones or Isaiah Brockington and just kind of let them go to work and I think that started to come back to bite them at the beginning of the Big Ten season where their offense looked kind of stagnant at times 
But I mean, at the past couple of games that I've been at, you can just hear Jim Ferry on the sideline the whole time, just stressing movement a lot and really getting motion, lots of passes and just kind of move around the floor and open up those driving lanes that Sam Sussons and Isaiah Brockington have really exploited over the past couple of games. So I think that once they get those lanes going, then that's now opened up shots on the outside for guys like Myron Jones or Seth Lundy to start hitting. So I think they've also improved in that asset aspect as well. Um, Tanian, I want to ask you specifically about uh, Seth Lundy. You know, he had a couple of games where he was in a drought. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he did he go an entire game without scoring at all? I believe so. I think yeah. it was against Virginia Tech. I forget if it was zero or like two points, but he really had a rough game after he started the season yeah. on fire. I remember watching and I was like, wow, like this guy could be a genuine like NBA draft prospect. He is the length of the forward position. And that's like the new thing that they want in the league is those three and D prospects who have the length and can just sit on the wings and knock down threes. But I think his really just went through your stereotypical shooting slump where you just start to lose your confidence a little bit. And I think now that he just started hitting threes again and Penn State has started winning again, I think he's starting to get some of that confidence back. And it's really started to show in his game. So I think now he's just kind of getting his feet back under him again. And I think going forward, he's going to be a really integral part of this team. I mean, they need him to start knocking down those threes, especially if their defense isn't playing well. Like we talked about, this team is going to win by just outscoring their opponent. So they need him and Myron and Isaiah to be playing at the top of their game for the rest of the season in the league, as good as the Big Ten is. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, do you... he definitely does heal a lot, I must say. Sorry, Alexis, go ahead. What were you going to say? No, that's okay. Um, do you see Seth Lundy, you know, developing into sort of a player how Lamar Stevens was that could really drive on his own terms whenever he wanted to, but also pull up from, you know, five or six feet beyond the arc? I think that a lot of people tried to compare him too much at the beginning of the season to Lamar. And I think their games are really different from each other. I mean, I think Seth this year has started to go into the post a little bit more and worked on those like turnaround jumpers that you're hitting from like a couple feet off the block there. But I think the main strong suit of the game is his three point shot, which was kind of Lamar's weakness that a lot of like the NBA scouts highlighted. And that's probably one of the reasons why he wasn't drafted. But I mean, I think that, the comparisons don't necessarily fit between him and Seth Lundy. However, I mean, Seth is really one of the few like young players on the team that gets a lot of minutes for them. Penn State's a very like veteran heavy team. So he's obviously going to start to set the course for the future of this program over the next couple of years. So they're going to need him to kind of blossom and to start him in the big 10. And I think he has the skill set to do that. It's just, can he remain confident in his shot and start producing at a high level that the team needs him to produce that. So looking forward to the next game with Ohio State now that just been announced recently, what are the key elements to Penn State potentially beating Ohio State or Ohio State even upsetting Penn State? Like what could be their downfall? I think that Ohio State is one of those teams in the Big Ten that I don't think they necessarily have a star, but they really have five guys who can go out there on any given night and go put up like 15 points on you. They're a really deep and talented team across the board. So I think it's for Penn State, it's going to be still continuing to correct a lot of those problems that have plagued them for the entire Big Ten conference schedule so far, just keeping those fouls down. I mean, a number of times during last game, like I think in the last couple of minutes, they were able to still have fouls left to give. And usually in a game, they'd be well into the double bonus by the time there's like five fouls left. So it really does make a difference. I mean, they were, I think it was well, like within the top of 5% of the country and giving up fouls to their opponent. So it really makes a difference down the stretch. And I mean, defending the pain is going to be a big thing, but I think that for Penn state, a big thing is going to be just trying getting the scoring output that they need. I don't think that their defense is going to really improve dramatically anytime soon. So I think they just need to continue to get open looks from three and then also hit those driving lanes as we talked about earlier. So, I mean, it's going to be a dog fight like any game in the Big Ten is. It's probably going to come down to the wire. So it's really going to be the leadership on the floor. And I think Penn State has that as well. And John Harar and Jamar Wheeler and all the other juniors that they have on their team. It's going to be really about how much those guys want this win. And they really need it if they're going to try to make a run for the tournament here. Um. 
Tanya, I want to get your opinion on, you know, the other teams in the Big Ten. You know, obviously we've seen Penn State match up against a couple of them, but, like, what teams do you see as being the most complete that will be able to, you know, have the best chance of winning, you know, Big Ten regular season and even the tournament? I mean, I think there's really – a number of teams that really have a lot of talent across the board. I mean, the big three so far have been Iowa, Illinois, and Michigan, I think, and I'll get to them later, but Ohio State is another team that's been really good as well. I don't think Michigan State hasn't had the greatest year, but they are really have talent, I think, that they can come back and really make the name for themselves. And then even Wisconsin and Purdue have both had strong starts to the Big Ten season. But I think the big three are Iowa, Illinois, and Michigan. And there are three of the teams that were expected to be at the top of the conference. I mean, when you have Iowa's really has a transcendent talent and Luca Garza at the center position there and just watching him play is something else. I mean, he can do anything you want him to. He can pass, he can rebound, he can score from anywhere on the floor. So I'm anxious to see Penn State match up against them. He's going to be a handful to defend, especially for a team that struggles to defend the paint. So we'll see how that goes. And Illinois, I mean, when you have two of maybe, I'd say, the top 20 players in the country, in Ayodesumu and Kofi Coburn, Illinois, you're going to be able to play with anyone. So it's really kind of the other guys on the squad there for the Illini that are going to make or break their season, I think. They have a number a number of younger talents and Adam Miller, who's a freshman, who's played pretty well for them. So I think it's going to be how well their depth performs. And then Michigan also is another experienced team, but the guy who's really leading them is their, their freshman. Again, another center in the big 10, unsurprisingly. And Hunter Dickinson, who's really, I mean, he dominated Penn state in the one game they played against them. So Every team in the Big Ten really has a lot of experience, which is really the name of the game in college basketball nowadays. I mean, we've seen this season a lot of the teams who've kind of like Kentucky and Duke and North Carolina, who've kind of ushered in that one and done style team where their team is populated with freshmen, really haven't performed as well. And it's now the teams that really have that veteran presence have begun to rise to the top of college basketball. And those three teams definitely have that. Cool. Okay, Tanyan, last question. So Penn State, two games now that they won from Conference, Rutgers and Northwestern. Should Penn State fans get their hopes up? I think I would be reserved. Yeah, I mean, Rutgers and Northwestern are both teams that have lost like over five of their last games. So it was only a matter of time before Penn State started to play some of those weaker teams and in the schedule there. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they started 0-5 is because they played some of the premier teams in the conference. And I think they had the number one strength of schedule last week, and now they're down to the number two in the Ken Palm rankings, at least. But I mean, they've had a really rough go of it schedule-wise from the start, even their non-conference games. So I think going forward, I mean, this Ohio State game, I really think is going to be a critical point in their season. If they can get a win over a team that's ranked and has performed really well in the Big Ten, I think that can kind of jumpstart the rest of the season here. And they're going to have plenty of opportunities to get those signature wins that any tournament team has. So they definitely still have plenty of games left to be able to make a run of the tournament. And they're going to have the Big Ten tournament as well to kind of try to make a name for themselves. So going forward, it's really just going to be a matter of, like we talked about, just correcting those errors that they've kind of been dealing with all season and just winning the games when it matters the most. Every game is going to be close. So it's kind of, who does what they need to do in the end. So we'll see. Okay, Tanya. Well, thanks for coming on today with to talk with us. Uh, again, Penn State's still going up against Ohio State, who just beat Wisconsin 74-62. to Again, Ohio State won that. So looking forward to another great game and hope to have you back on later in the future. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Hope yeah, to see yeah. you again as well. All right. See you. Okay. We're going to wrap up with the game schedule for this upcoming week. On Monday, women's basketball will play at home against Minnesota at 6 p.m. Wednesday, men's basketball will play at Ohio State at 7 p.m. Thursday, men's hockey will play at home against Notre Dame, and women's basketball will be on the road at Illinois at 7 p.m. On Friday, men's hockey will play against Notre Dame again. Men's volleyball will play against Ohio State. 
and women's hockey will be at Lindenwood at 8 10 and men's volleyball will start at 7 p.m and that is also against Ohio State all right thanks for listening to this episode of Sports Speak I'm Alexis Yoder alongside Jared Smith and stay tuned for our next episode bye bye